Brilliant. Welcome to uh, this CPD session this morning, everybody. Uh, we're really happy to have Julie Keys with us today. Um, it's a snow day here and it's a snow day in many places across the UK. So hopefully there'll be lots of people joining us as, as and when throughout the session. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, and after the session, we'll share this on social media, this recording. And we'll also put it on the Nexus website, which is nexus.education uh, in our blog section. I will put Julie Key's uh, contact details in there as well, so you can contact Julie with any questions throughout. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Julie now. He's going to talk to us today about how to build a solid foundation in your school on which principles of coaching are built to bring positive change to all staff. Julie, over to you. Thank you, Damien. Hello, everybody. Good morning. And I'm going to say good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, good night, depending on what time you're watching this, because I know that we are recording and um, you may be joining at a different time. So um, I am going to start my presentation. And as Damien said, if you have any questions, then please drop them into the chat um, and I will hopefully be able to get to them. But we only have half an hour, which means that really high level, this is just a little snapshot into coaching, embedding a coaching culture, what coaching is, um, et cetera. So if you want to know more and you want to go deeper on anything, then please uh, pop, a, pop a question into the chat and I can maybe address it towards the end of the presentation. Or I will have my contact details at the end. So if you want to get in contact with me, then you're more than welcome to. Um, also, finally, we will be following this up with a blog, which will have some resources and a little bit of a summary um, regarding uh, everything that you've got in this presentation as well. Um, OK, sorry, I'm just looking at what, uh, what Ian has just said. Um, um, and uh, yes, Ian, I think you're in the same boat as everybody else. We have, um, as Damien said, it's a snow day today, which means that people are backwards and forwards and they have their little ones at home. So please do what you need to do. Okay, um, welcome everybody. My name is Judy Keys, as Damien said. I am the lead coach at The Educational Coach. Um, we are experts in coaching and experts in coaching in education specifically. Um, and today's presentation is going to be about, as I said, a high level look at how you can start to consider embedding a coaching culture in schools and uh, what we have done successfully in the schools that we have worked in. So, Let's get started. So I am really hoping that through this and by the end of this, you will have understood what coaching is. I'm presuming that some of you already know that, but it's always good to start from a baseline level of assuming no knowledge. And uh, not because I think you're idiots, but because I think that it's good to ensure that everybody has the same information and um, to understand the pillars by which you can start to embed a successful coaching culture. I always start with this quote at the beginning of every training session that I do um, or any kind of interaction that I have with schools. Um, and I, I'll tell you why I put it in for a couple of reasons. Um, so in the 21st century, people don't want to be managed. They expect to be coached. I think it's a really powerful statement and I'd like you to just consider it for a minute and just sort of let it sit with you. I know that we will all know when we have felt like we've been managed rather than when we've been led and inspired perhaps, or been coached. And I put that here because that is now an expectation. Uh, people entering any industry, coming out of university, coming out of school, um, will expect that the, the way in which um, personal growth and professional development is conducted in that organization is through coaching rather than being managed. Now, it's a little bit divisive that, um, that quote, because it implies that management is bad and coaching is good. Management per se is not bad. There is certainly places and times when you need to have management. And I'm thinking particularly when it's um, a one-way interaction, I'm thinking particularly around uh, things like compliance, that type of thing. But when we're talking about developing people, um, their personal growth and their professional development, being coached is a way of operating, a way of managing, a way of leading that is really quite distinct to a traditional management style. I also put it here because as a reminder, and many of you are, probably are school leaders or are in a position uh, of being an experienced educator, um, that people who are entering the teaching profession when they're leaving university, they have a choice at that point. They have a choice of which industry they want to go into, what profession they would like to pursue. And in other professions, 
this is an expectation and this will be given uh, as a matter of course. So if we are going to try and encourage people to be teachers, to stay in the profession longer than the zero to five years, that's the normal tip off curve. And we are also asking them to have potentially a higher workload than other, indus other industries, potentially less pay than other industries then we are going to have to make sure that we are going to develop them as professionals and personally through a coaching style, because that is what they will expect and that's what they will get if they move into other industries. It's very difficult when there's no one speaking back to me and I realize that you can't, but I'm just, I'm just speaking to myself here. But um, I know that you'll have questions at the end. I often get asked about the impact of coaching because this is the sort of the reason why you might do it. And um, traditionally where, where coaching has uh, had um, a lot of impact and has been quite widespread is in the corporate sector. And the corporate sector, as we would recognize as educators, is really different from education. So a lot of the metrics that they might use, i.e. their return on investment, how much they spend on coaching, coach training, embedding coaching, should convert into revenue generated for the business. That's the traditional metric that they're going to use to, to assess the impact of coaching. However, lots of uh, institutes and associations, so the Institute for Coaching, the Association for Coaching, and the uh, International Coaching Federation have done lots of studies around what the impact is to do with behaviors, attitudes, and mindsets as a result of coaching or because of the absence of coaching. And this one, this stat stands out to me particularly, which cites that over 70% of individuals who receive coaching benefited from an improved work performance relationship and more effective communication skills. And the reason I picked that one out is that last part, relationships and more effective communication skills. That is the bread and butter of what we do in schools. Our relationships are key. And the way that we communicate with our prim primary three stakeholders, our parents, um, our colleagues and our pupils, we have to be really effective communicators. It's, it's what we do every single day. And actually, I'd argue that probably teachers have more daily interactions than, well, certainly most professions, but it would be up there with some of the other service professions and also um, healthcare individuals and things like that. So having effective communication skills and developing positive relationships are really central to our overall performance and our overall satisfaction about the work that we do um, with the pupils in our care. I'm going to go through the fundamentals and this is where it feels like I'm teaching people to suck eggs because I know that most of you will know this but for my benefit and potentially for the benefit of anybody who's watching this back who has is coming to coaching completely cold doesn't really know anything about it we're going to go through the basics and uh, this graphic is about as basic as they come uh, I hope you'll be able to follow along with it if you have a look at the um, the I'm going to start with this bubble at the end. I'm going to work my way across. If you can see my mouse, hopefully you can. In fact, it really doesn't matter. I'm starting at one end and moving to the other. So whichever way you, you look at this graphic is the way that you're going to interpret it. So down one end, we have um, services like uh, counseling and therapy. Then right in the middle, that middle circle is coaching. Then we have mentoring and um, consultancy or advisory services. So if I just go back to... Um, therapy and counselling. There are some really strong similarities between therapy and counselling and coaching, but there are also some really strong differences. The similarities are typically these are things, it's an approach to a conversation. And so lots of the techniques that are used, lots of the questioning techniques that are used for both of those things are really similar to coaching. It's usually done in a one-to-one -one setting, although obviously you can have couples and group therapy and also coaching. Um, and it's a confidential service, an entirely confidential service, which is led by the person who uh, has come to therapy, the person seeking therapy or the coachee. So that's, the, that's a real fundamental similarity, which is um, the balance of power or the direction in which those sessions go is played out by the person who has come to receive coaching or has come to receive therapy. Um, it's the role of the therapist and for the coach 
to explore issues that are brought to the table by that person. The differences are um, coaching is usually predominantly used in a professional setting, although obviously our personal lives um, are very much intertwined with our professional choices um, and our career progression generally. So it's very difficult to untangle the two of those things, but typically coaching is focused um, in a professional context, whereas therapy and counseling is very much more usually a personal context. Another difference is that therapy and counseling is predominantly present and past focused um, and usually trauma induced. So people are coming to therapy because they have experienced some kind of trauma or an ongoing trauma um, in their lives that is affecting them in their present. Whereas coaching is predominantly present and future focused. So that's not to say that we don't do context setting. That's not to say that we don't find out about a person and explore um, perhaps their career progression, even some of delving into their personal life as well. However, it is not trauma induced. And as such, the training by which a therapist and a counselor undertake and a coach undertake are really different. And the techniques that, that sit behind those, although uh, front facing might seem quite similar, are actually very different in terms of their approach. Then if I skip over coaching for a minute and go to mentoring, mentoring and coaching are often grouped together. In fact, I have a session later today that is called coaching and mentoring. I didn't choose the title, but I will talk about both of those things. Um, they're often grouped together and there is a, that's quite problematic because often people think they're one of the same and they're not. There is, a, there is a strong difference. And just like therapy and counseling and coaching, there are similarities between coaching and mentoring, but there are also really strong differences. The main difference is that mentoring comes from a place of experience, usually, unless you're doing reverse mentoring and reverse mentoring is super interesting. So if you're interested in finding out about that, go and have a look, which is when you're mentored by someone who is at a different stage, usually a, a much more inexperienced stage in their career uh, than you, and they mentor you generally to give a different perspective. Um, but in a traditional mentoring uh, relationship, it is somebody who has walked that path before and is able to offer advice, guidance and support because of that experience. Likewise, for our final bubble, we have consultancy or advisory services, and that is also guidance, support and advice, but usually with a very specific area of focus, a very specific topic. So, for example, you might go to a consultant because you're looking to revamp your numeracy curriculum for key stage two and that person has real areas of expertise and experience in that and is able to help and guide and support you through their experience coaching sits right in the middle of that and it's and it's really um distinctly present and future focused and distinctly not an advice giving service which sounds um tricky um, and it is in fact the hardest part of being a coach which is the um having to refrain from jumping into advice giving which is where you would traditionally sit as a mentor you would be able to say share your wisdom and your guidance and say when I was in your position these were the challenges that came up and this is how I dealt with them coaching is not like that and in actual fact a good coach should be able to coach in any industry regardless of their background and the background of the person they're coaching. Um, because the role of the coach is to change perspective, ask challenging questions, to dig deeper into thinking, um, allow the coachee to be empowered to make their own goals, their own pathway. And that doesn't rely on technical expertise in a particular area. So for example, I have in the past coached lawyers. They're not looking to me to explain a particular type of piece of law or to explore the topic of mergers of, and acquisitions with them. They're looking to me to go through topics that are actually very common to lots of industries, delegation, trust, time management, um, how to manage upwards, all of those types of things, how to have difficult conversations, all of those types of things sit in that coaching space. If you have any questions about it, please do pop it into the chat because I'm going to move over to the next, my next slide. So this is the key part. You want to know how to embed a coaching culture. We now know what coaching is and what it isn't. 
And just to say, just to go back to that previous um, graphic for a minute, um, those services can work in tandem. You can have a therapist and a coach. You can have a mentor and a coach, but it's the recognition that they are playing distinct roles in your development as a person or as, as a professional. So we've come up and, you know, you have to love an acronym. I'm so pleased that it fits into this acronym of HELP. Um, but um, we have come up with a method that we believe works really well in all the schools that we've worked in. Um, and when I explain it to people, when they're starting out and thinking about how to embed a coaching culture, it makes sense to people. So I'm going to share it with you now. The first stage is hook. And we define hook by getting people hooked in, getting people excited, um, finding out if people are interested in coaching. And essentially at the bottom of all of it is, are we ready? Are we ready for coaching? And lots of factors might go into that. So I can't second guess what everybody's different um, situations are. But for example, if you have lots of initiatives that you are trying to embed right now, is that the right time to introduce something else to layer on top? It might be the perfect time, but it might be too much for your staff. Perhaps you're just preparing for inspection and perhaps now is not the right time Perhaps you've had a big turnover of staff. This is particularly true in international schools um, where there may well be a huge exodus of staff all in one go. Um, that is also a time to consider, are we ready? It might be, as I said before, might be the perfect time. You've got a whole new intake. You can start something from new. But that first stage is really important. It's in fact the stage that I say to schools, spend the most time doing that. Don't come to us yet until you know whether you are actually ready for coaching. The second part is experience. We believe to be a good coach, you have to be coached by somebody who knows what they're doing, because otherwise it's a little bit blind leading the blind. And that can uh, end up in poor practice. And it can also end up in poor embedment, and also can end up in slower embedment as well. So with there's there's three reasons we say that experiencing coaching is a positive thing. Number one, it's just a positive thing. If you have a regular meeting with a coach, um, it's great professional development and it's a space and time just for you. Secondly, you're getting good coaching role modeled for you. And third of all, you start to develop empathy for your coachee. At some point, you are going to be the coach. And so it, it is very useful to know what it feels like to be coached. Sometimes it can be quite a vulnerable space. Sometimes you have to understand how you can frame questions and set the sessions up and contract the sessions so that your coachee feels safe, safe to share, safe to be vulnerable um, and safe to respond to your questioning, which can sound quite challenging in the moment. The third um, step is to learn. This is where you start to upskill yourself with um, the skills you need to be a coach. Now, of course, you've already done the experience part, so you know what it like, what it feels like. You know what it looks like and you know what good looks like. You also know what it feels like as a coachee. So when you're coming to the section where you're doing training, you already have a good idea of how this is going to look in reality. And we push this all the way down because what, what we used to have happen was people approach us and say, please, can you come and do a training session? And we realized that the training to be a coach really has to come a few steps after. Because if you jump into that straight away, your levels of success and embedment are going to be lower. And the final thing is practice. As with everything, you know, as per the 10,000 hours theory, uh, to become an expert in something, you need to practice it and you need to practice it regularly. And you need to practice it with the supervision of somebody who knows what good coaching looks like. So the person that you experience coaching with will also be someone who sits alongside you to do some of that practice. We're gonna do a very, very quick run through of this. This usually takes about three terms of an academic year, but we're gonna try and do it within the next five, 10 minutes. Um, so experience, learn, practice is the way in which we embed a coaching culture in a school. And it offers just enough structure, but also the flexibility to ensure that those desired outcomes for each school are met. 
So let's look at experience first of all. Now, I can't coach you all individually. I certainly can't coach the people who are watching this um, recording back. Um, so we're going to do a very high level version of coaching. Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to come off mute or come on your camera. I want you to do this individually so that you have an experience of what it might feel like. And I'm going to I'm going to lean very heavily on one technique, which is um, shown by Michael Bungay Sten Stenner. I always get his name wrong. He's an Australian and he wrote a book called The Coaching Habit. Very famous book. Please go read if you want to go and have a look at it. And um, we use his TED talk, which is taming the advice monster in all our training because it's fantastic. If I were to distill down what coaching is about, it's summed up in this phrase, staying curious for longer. That is the challenge that you have as a coach. So with this in mind, I'm going to run through a series of questions or a, sort of a questioning routine. And while I do that, I'd like you to try and do this in real time. And I know that that sounds cliche and it's difficult and, you know, but clear, clear the decks for a minute, put things down, just have a think about something. I'm going to ask you to think of something. It sounds like I'm doing a magic trick. I'm not. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about something that is a real challenge for you right now. Something that's going on for you right now. It could be professional or personal uh, relationship. It could be a tiny thing. It could be big. Have a think about something that is a challenge for you right now. I'm going to think of my forever challenge, which is that I need to get fitter and it's January. So it really does feel like a cliche, but have a think about what your challenge is. Have you got your challenge in mind? Okay. With that challenge, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and I'd like you to try and think through your answers. This is only going to take a couple of minutes. With that challenge in mind, think about this question. What's the real challenge here for you? What's the real challenge here for you? I'm thinking about my challenge. What's the real challenge here for you? My next question is again, a very simple question and it stays in this thread of staying curious for longer. With that challenge in mind, And what else? What else is a real challenge for you? Because I know that it's not only one thing. What else about that main challenge that you said is also a real challenge? Open it up a little bit more. Just unbox that a little bit. And if you're done thinking about that, my next question is, and what else? Because I know that you can probably think about two or three things that are related to that challenge. And if I think about my exercise one, at the top, if I asked, what's the real challenge here for you? I'd say, I don't do enough exercise. Um, I could um, consider getting, I want to get fitter. I want to get healthy. I want to feel healthier. Um, and then if you're asking me, and what else? It might be to do with, uh, having more energy it might be to do with looking at my diet um, but the challenge for me is I think a lot of the time I don't have enough time um, and I might ask my keep asking myself and what else and what else until I I have a good few challenges around this main challenge so the final question well, it's actually not the final question the next question is the first question so with all that in mind what's the real challenge here for you and what you should notice is likely the first challenge you said is not the same as what the real challenge is for you. And often when I do this exercise and I always, use, I always use exercise as the example, it gets down to quite a deep level quite quickly, which is it's not that I don't want to do exercise. It's not that I haven't found an exercise that I want to do. Um, it's not just that I don't have enough time, although that is a reality. It's, it's also about why don't I prioritize time for myself? That's a deeper question. Um, and that's the real challenge. That's actually a mindset shift, an attitude shift about prioritizing my time, my health to ensure that I'm getting the benefit from exercise. And then the very final question he asks in the video, which is an incredibly powerful question is, 
What do you want? What do you want? It's an action question and it's the foundation for change. What do you want? You can get really specific in this moment as well. So that's only been a really quick three minute experience um, of, uh, of coaching, but, um, and I can just see someone's just come into the waiting room. So I'm just gonna let them back in again. Um, that's been a really quick experience of coaching, but in a coaching session, that would be very well developed. And also, of course, we would be having a dialogue. It wouldn't just be me speaking into the ether and asking questions. Um, we would be having a dialogue around it. So that's a, a mini experience of coaching for you. Let's have a look at learn. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and tool that I share in, in our training session, our first one. It's, it's one that I use every day in every one of my coaching sessions. And there's a little bit of theory. The theory is self-determination theory. And if you haven't heard of it, you need to remember it because you will show it, see it showing up in every single one of your conversations, interactions, and relationships in your life. Self-determination theory says that all humans want or need the following things. Autonomy, power over choice, decision-making, feel like they have control over their lives. Uh, mastery, a sense that they are confident and competent at something. It doesn't have to be everything, but everybody needs something that they feel like they're competent at. And relatedness to others, unless you have a serious psychological problem, then, uh, and you're a sociopath, um, you, relationships with other people are really important. And it's the way in which these things interconnect that is key. So I often show it as a, as a triangle. And actually in my coaching sessions and in my coaching notes, I always write it down as a triangle. And I circle the one that I hear is the thing that is being told, that is the challenge. So go back to your challenge that we just did in our coaching, our very brief coaching exercise just before. Which one of these things is it most likely relate to? Is it because you don't have choice or you don't have autonomy or you don't feel like you have control over something? Or perhaps that somebody else has too much control? That comes up a lot. Um, mastery, does it, do you feel as though, you know, when you're talking about this challenge, you're just saying to yourself, I don't feel confident or I don't feel like I'm good enough. That's impost that imposter syndrome sits very much in that mastery part. And then the relatedness to others is, was your challenge about a relationship issue with somebody else? Now, the reason that these are important to show them like this is because they are interconnected. I'll give you a really brief example. Often if somebody um, feels as though they don't have a high level of mastery, they don't feel confident and competent, maybe they're starting a brand new job or they're just getting to grips with a role or something, they will more willingly give up their autonomy because they're being guided by others in that moment. And they also start to consider the weight of other people's opinion, the relatedness to others features more heavily. So if I don't feel good enough or I don't feel confident, I start looking to the opinions of other people to either validate or in some cases it invalidates my feelings around things. So you can see how this is shown as a kind of equilateral triangle, but more often than not, it's skewed in one way or another because an area is being impacted. So I'd like you to just consider that when you have your interactions. What is the thing that is showing up here for somebody? Is it that they're telling you that they don't have choice, they don't have control? Is it that they're telling you they don't feel confident enough or competent? Or is it that they have some kind of issue around relationships or relatedness to others? Um, sort of fun side fact is that I now notice this every time I listen to music, popular music, songs, pop music is always about one of these three things. Have a listen to the radio today and see if you can figure it out. Um, and finally, practice. Now, that's not something that we can do in this session, but practice is really important. It's how you get better at coaching. And uh, by doing it every day and making it part of every conversation that you have with people, your quality of your conversations will go up. You will notice that by withholding your advice monster, by staying curious for longer, asking deeper questions, noticing things about what somebody is saying, actively listening to them, thinking about the questions you're asking them, 
you will have better quality conversations. And that can happen with your family relationships, your romantic relationships, your work relationships, your relationships with your pupils and your parents at your school. And now I'm just gonna talk about embedment quickly because I've talked you through that method, hook, experience, learn, practice. Imagine this is year one in your school. You've gone through this. Year two, you repeat it with the next cohort of people who are interested in coaching. Don't get them involved unless they're interested. That's the hook part. So, but now you're doing experience, you have a cohort of coaches who are experienced. So they can coach the next cohort. You're starting to bring this all internally into your school. Learn is something, again, you might want to look externally for training to ensure that you're getting that consistency across year cohort one and cohort two. And then practice. You have coaches in your school who now can sit alongside your next cohort and ensure that the practice that they're doing is quality um, and give them their support, in, uh, give support to the, the second cohort um, by sitting alongside them and tweaking their practice as they go through. So that's year one, year two. And you, as you can see, it can start to embed. Um, I want to just finish up by talking about how the impact that we've seen in some of our schools some of our schools we're now working, we're in our kind of year three uh, of working with them. And, you know, it's a, it's a terrible business model, but we kind of make ourselves redundant. Uh, that's, the, that's the aim is to kind of get out um, and, and ensure that that embedment is happening organically within the school. But what's so interesting for us is to see how schools take this and run with it in different ways. So not only is this about embedment in their conversations that they're having with their colleagues, that's usually how it starts. They start looking at the processes and systems that underpin that. The schools that we've worked in have overhauled their performance management systems or their appraisal systems. They've looked at how they do professional development generally. They've started looking at feedback conversations from lesson observations. In fact, some of them have kind of done away with or revisited how to do lesson observations in a way that works for them, that is done from a coaching perspective. Some schools have started looking at how they can embed this within their admin function. We have schools who um, bring along their head of HR and their head of finance. The head of HR has to have lots and lots of very difficult conversations every single day. So being able to practice that coaching conversation is really valuable for them. We've also had um, really strong embedment within their teaching assistants, where they bring their teaching assistants along and they do the training like this. And the way that they embed that is going to be so different to the way that your heads of departments are, your senior leaders are, your head or your support systems, uh, your support services do. So TAs typically are focused on how to have coaching conversations with children, one-to-one -one coaching conversations with children. Um, teachers look at how they are going to start embedding this within conversations with parents. All of that comes from learning the, um, the basics, learning uh, the theory, learning the skills, practicing it, experiencing it, and then deciding how you're going to embed it more deeply within all areas of your school. Because if you are a coaching school, this is an approach that you adopt. Um, it's something that you do as a matter of course, it's a, a way in which you conduct yourself through every aspect of your school. And I think that's it. Damien, and I hope I've kept a time. I've probably gone a little bit over, but if you want to know more, as, um, as Damien said, this is going to go out as a recording. Feel free to watch it back if you want to run that coaching exercise again for yourself, um, but also feel free to get in touch with us if you uh, want to know anything more, if you have any questions that come up after this session. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to see if there's anybody that has any questions in the chat, and if not, then I will end the um, session and end the call um, and thank everybody who have who's watched it live and everybody who will watch it afterwards and hope that you've got something out of it remember the very first part if you take anything away from this the very first part is determining readiness how do you know whether you're ready for this or not so I actually suggest to some people this is a bit forthright Put a reminder in your phone. If you want, if you want um, CPD to actually make an impact, it has to be action-based. 
it might not be action based today because you've got a snow day going on and you've got people at home and you're trying to plan lessons and you're also trying to figure out what you're going to do tomorrow. It's not going to happen today necessarily. But if you put an, a reminder in your phone with the question, are we ready for coaching? It will just give you a prompt. It might give you a prompt to go and speak to somebody, uh, raise it with your senior leadership team, read an article about coaching, ask people in the staff room, see whether you can start a working group about it. See if you can get some interest, ask other people who, whether they've read any books or articles or podcasts or listen to anything around that. That's the first stage. Everything else comes from there. So with that, I'm going to leave. Uh, I'm going to leave this session. I'm just going to just check whether I have any questions.